Feminism and Gender Nonconforming and Trans Deities, welcome to the Hood Wazee! We are Chicago's bi-weekly underground live and live stream news show that gives block optic and radical perspectives on culture and politics. I'm your host, Ricardo Gamboa, or Ricardo Gamboa, or as I am known across the globe, the radical Selena. <laughs> this uh, past Thursday was National Coming Out Day, but let's be real, the past few weeks have been like National Coming Out Month. <laughs> the Senate confirmed Kavanaugh and came out as fucking hating woman. Kanye appeared on SNL and came out as stupid. <laughs> and the UN published their report on climate change and we all came out as dead. <laughs> uh, actually, I came out years ago on Easter Sunday to celebrate my favorite gay religious icon, the bunny. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm fucking talking about Jesus. Because we all know Jesus was gay. He was a very radical fag. He was anti-capitalist, anti-status, hung out with drunks and sex workers and shared his body with a dozen dudes. He's basically my fucking twin. <laughs> yep, I came out as queer a while ago and came out as non-binary a couple years ago, so this year I just came out as uncircumcised. Woo! I was not alone. My foreskin came out as juicy. It's not even, it's not even. Uh, <laughs> uh, but don't worry, tonight's show will quench your radical thirst. <laughs> It's entitled Decolonization and Indigenous Practice. We'll be getting the breakdown in indigenous practice and activism in Chicago uh, with our guest from Shy Nations Youth Council. And our featured and musical guest this evening is the one, the only, Frank Juan. But keep your heads on because before we get to all that and transform you, we'll inform you with Khudwazi Tea Time. So last week, a jury found Jason Van Dyke guilty of second degree murder for the killing of Laquan McDonald. This was a historic moment Across the country, we've watched cop after cop kill black people with impunity and go back to work. Here in Chicago, Van Dyke was the first cop to even be charged with murder in decades. And we know that only happened because of the organizer who, organizers who've been demanding justice for Laquan McDonald. For many of us, this verdict came with a mix of emotions. So I want to take a moment to process it together. Uh, for us up here, what was your initial reaction to the verdict? It was, it was hard because I didn't want to face it, I think. I think I was... I was really nervous and you know, processing later with friends and, and coworkers and even students, the going deeply into like why we're even consciously scared of the verdict. Um, that we're like literally conditioned to think that corruption's gonna happen. I guess I, for me I wanna just one um, give praise to all the fearless organizers, those that are here still and those that are not. Um, we lost a lot of people to suicide, we lost a lot of people to incarceration people that are directly impacted by this and also shutting down the expressway. Shout out to the fearless leadership of black women, um, mm -hmm. folks from BYP 100, Sada's Daughters, um, who literally put their bodies on the line to bring attention and raise awareness around this case. Um, without those actions, I don't know if this decision would have been made the way it was. Absolutely. Um, they had to raise it to a level of visibility. Um, and they did that in a fearless way. And when the decision came down, I was like, fuck. How do we keep this power moving forward because the fight's not over? Um, so being on the ground with like some of the organizers like during like that moment, it was like a cathartic, like uh, it's like cathartic sadness almost uh, because we want to like keep the pressure going in terms of like uh, keep on holding like officers accountable, but we also recognize like what it took to get to that moment. And the fact that like Laquan's case is an excessive like case, it took like 16 shots for like a, a officer to be held accountable. It took like uh, this teenager being a ward of a state, going through like a juvenile detention centers. The case of Laquan is like one of the most severe cases of like the system not giving a fuck about you. Um, and the fact that he was like murdered 16 times and the fact that folks for four years had to organize on behalf of him points to like damn, this, like, it's really hard to get some type of justice. And this isn't even justice for like a lot of people. Like, that's what I was thinking the whole time. I'm like, it's a shame where we think that uh, progress is when we can finally yep. hold a cop accountable. Yep. To me, like progress is like when we hit the streets and start marching for like sexual assault, mm -hmm. you know, or, or like when a, a cop rapes somebody, like 16 shots is a bit excessive for, for uh, us to start framing things as, as victories and whatnot. Right. So we were walking, we went to a bar to celebrate our reading and like those of us that were in it were tense as fuck and we walk into 
the bar below, which is this, uh, on State and Wabash. And I walked out and I was like, I'm going to get fucking killed. Because it was like <laughs> all these white people there. And I was like, if like, I know me, like I'm, I make a whole show so I could talk shit, right? Like, and I'm like, yo, like I'm going to go off if he's like found not guilty. And then I was like, or I might cheer too much if he's found guilty and still get killed. And uh, when they uh, announced that he was guilty, it was like me. Um, it was me and like, it was our table. And then it was like table of black women. We just like started like cheering as loud as we can. And like, I started crying. And then um, I looked around the corner and there was like this like table of like white women cheering. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> and then like, like all these like white dudes at the bar started like cheering and this is not like my like redemption tale about white people but it made me like but it did make me feel it did make me feel some kind of way you know what i mean like about like man like you know maybe there is a a nudge forward because i don't expect it to come from there Um, i think one of the things that scares me is like we know that whenever power makes these concessions and this is the first time i've talked to this on uh, you know on the show is whenever power makes concessions it's it's usually um a concession so that it could determine the limits of how far these movements go and how far they can they can to determine the extent of their damage to systemic power and so that's what makes me nervous like yo we got we gave you van dyke right and i think that's very clear in the way that you know van dyke was um you know was was found guilty and then the next day kavanaugh was confirmed Mm -hmm. so this week the united nations international panel on climate change released a pretty dire climate change report concluding that humans only have 12 more years to live Oh, wait, actually, it's just capitalism only has 12 more years to live. (laughs) In order to avoid climate collapse, we have to cut carbon emissions by 45% uh, by the year 2030. On the one hand, there's affirmation that, oh, yes, you know, how can we be saying that climate change is not real? This is proof, blah, blah, blah. And and for those of us who are from the Caribbean, like, the fact that there's even a conversation about whether climate change or, or not is real is is like outrageous. When I came to the US and like actual politicians, like that's a part of public discourse, is is mind blowing. Because for the Caribbean, like you're looking, you're seeing Puerto Rico, you're seeing Cuba, you're seeing Dominica. Like for us, it's like when a hurricane hits you, it's like a hundred percent of your GDP is done. It's not. You know, and, and the Caribbean releases, we have the lowest, um, we call it uh, greenhouse gas emissions, like lowest contributors, but we are the first ones. Those of us who are from islands, we're the first ones impacted. And in fact, the Caribbean has been asking, has been saying that it should be 1.5 is where we want to go, not 2. So it's actually not good news <coughs> for us. If we're all going to live, we just have to... Yeah, stop plastic, man. <laughs> <laughs> we have to stop making plastic. And I mean, even I, like that's staring the, at this cup, I'm right. like, we should have teacups. That's the first thought when you're right. like tea time. I'm like, why don't we have a teacup instead of this plastic cup? You could bring that up at our next all Hoodwazi <laughs> collective membership meeting and just want to drop it now. <laughs> Thanks, this palm Hilda. tree is so I'll drink big. out of the bottle for the rest of the night. We're good. <laughs> we have to take action now, right? And that, that goes with... Um, Thinking about the energy companies that we work with, like we're all still using gas. We're all still, you know, you know, we're still part of the pipelines. We're, st- you know, we're st- I'm still using gas. You know, I brought pro- propane yesterday. Um, but you know, going solar, it's like really important. We like we need to start really going solar, this big, especially in big cities. You know, mm-hmm. um, number one, and then number two is yeah, definitely stop using this shit, abolishing. You know, stop. <laughs> it sucks. It sucks because no, we're all. They got us. They got us. But, uh, if but I see one more plastic cup, <laughs> I, I have three, but <laughs> it's bad. It's bad. It's bad. So what the, what gets me so angry about this like climate change like moment is that the people that actually do it get to be immune, right? right? Yes. Yeah. They get to be to immune. I mean, there's literally Echo Atlantic in Nigeria. I talk about it all the time on this show, um, in which like the richest people in the world have made a whole city that could self-sustain for 250 years off the coast of Nigeria while the coastline in Nigeria is already receding. I just want to say I'm really scared of being up here. So <laughs> Thanks for having me up. Welcome, um, welcome. I, I wanted to... Are you scared of this nipple chin? <laughs> <laughs> Don't make me look at it. <laughs> Shake it. No look. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to um, highlight like this kind of, uh, a bit of tension in the way that we talk about this issue um, between like the the fact that like um, 
the global economy and like the way that like capitalism works is very extractive and like um like does not slow down in the way that it damages the earth and the way that it's racist in in like who it this damage affects right mm -hmm. and also like between that and the conversation about like what can we do about it as like the people in this room, right? There are uh, one like one hundred um, corporations and companies in uh, the world that create seventy one percent of the like carbon emissions and environmental damage um, uh, to the globe. And so I think like you know I think personally. There's a lot of things you can do to reduce your own impact as an individual. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think, like, individualist action is really not, not going to slow any of this down, mm -hmm. you know? Nope. Um, so, well, like... Well, on everyone's parade. I was going to get rid of the plastic <laughs> cops, you <laughs> asshole. <laughs> get I'll rid of the plastic them. cops, Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, like, the way, the way to really... To, to be effective at reversing or like slowing down this damage, which is really, I think, what, what we have to hope for, is um, making it costly for the people who, who are extracting this profit from the earth and keeping it for themselves. Um, like redistributing that damage from people who have nothing and aren't, aren't contributing to this damage. Um, redistributing that damage and the cost of this environmental I love that because we always talk about redistributing resources and I like the idea of like we're gonna redistribute damage. I'm gonna punch you bitch. Now to give us the breakdown on indigenous practice and activism in Chicago, we've got Shy Nations Youth Council. Let's give it up for our guest for the breakdown this evening. All right, so first of all, for people who are unfamiliar, uh, Janie, can you explain how Shy Nation Youth Council got started? Okay, so um, back in like 2012, um, there was a youth, a group of adults. Uh, we were getting together and talking about what the youth need, and then eventually we just asked one of the kids, we're like, what do you think the youth need? And they're like, we need you guys to stop speaking for us. <clears throat> there was a group of young people from uh, a Native Youth Council, Shy Society, and then myself, I was in Urban Native Chicago. So those two things came together and we kind of created Shy Nations. Um, and we have a mission of, creating safe space for Native youth through arts, activism, and education, mostly just letting the youth speak for themselves. I was like, what are some of the main actions uh, you guys have taken as a group? Um, Shy Nations also, we, are, we also do a lot of stuff here in Chicago, um, you know, just in um, educating people on the land that they're standing on. You guys are standing on indigenous lands. Mm -hmm. Chicago has always been a city. It's always been a trading point for indigenous people uh, from South America to Alaska and further up um, so we do a lot of education uh, land-based education too with the uh, indigenous land knowledge and the, uh, our plant relatives that are that grow through the con uh, through the concrete uh, we're educating ourselves and we're learning our own culture and we also relay that back to people and we also uh, educate other people because um, we are teachers as much as we are learners it's so like Eli and like Adrian, can you tell us about like uh, what the, like how you, a little bit about your background, how you came to like Chi Nations Youth Council and this type of work? Uh, so when I was a kid, um, uh, she made the group and um, I, 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 at first I wasn't too, too, I wasn't trying to participate, you know, because I was trying to hang out with my friends and the, the You're like, this activist <laughs> shit is not as cool throw, as. <laughs> throw, throw rocks at cars, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, but uh, as I started to get older, I started to realize, you know, this is my chance to finally get, get in touch with my roots, you know. And, um, and uh, slowly, slowly but surely, I started to participate. And uh, uh, we did, like, these nature walks when I was a kid and learning about plants uh, that are native to Chicago. Me personally, uh, my aunt helped f uh, start the group. My brother's the co-president. So I grew up, you know, all these people in my life being a part of the Shy Nations. I used to t hear the stories of my aunts being in UNC. Uh, just seeing all this positive uh, native work as a kid growing up into that and eventually being a part of the group and being, you know, a leader in the community. 
And so like, I'm wondering, like, how do you approach the issue of gentrification in, in Chicago? And how can we frame like, our work with a decolonial, frame gentrification work within a decolonial lens? I want to start by saying, you know, natives were the first people gentrified. We were the first people pushed off our lands. You know, ever since Europeans stepped on this continent, we've been get, being pushed, pushed off of our lands. Um, you know, getting pushed further and further west, getting pushed onto reservations, um, just different things like that. But now, uh, you know, we're here 2018, natives are living in the city, we're practicing our culture in the city, but we're also a part of the Chicago community, our neighborhood communities um, who are, you know, brown, who are uh, low income, and we're getting pushed out of our neighborhoods, you know, so it's like a second coming, uh, gentrification, genocide, kind of, you know, genocide's been happening on this continent since Christopher Columbus and his boys came. How I personally combat gentrification is whenever white people are walking past me, I'm like, fucking white people. <laughs> I, try, I try to make them feel uncomfortable in my neighborhood. I try to make them feel unwanted in, right, in my right, neighborhood, right. you know. Uh, like AJ was saying, you know, like fucking white people, you know, I try to make them feel uncomfortable. But, uh, I think one way you could uh, fight it is uh, just support your local bakeries, you know, uh, anything um, that people in the community own. Just because it's owned by somebody in the community doesn't mean they're not gentrified. Oh my God, I love you so much. I was like, why are you not my nephew? Like, <laughs> so like they were saying, like this, this started in the 1700s. You know, there was treaties that that forced native people off of these lands and it was all because of those waterways, right? So um, because we had the Chicago River, because we had the Lake Michigan, they seen these as highways and they pushed us off. When we talk about the beginning of Chicago, we have to start at 1700, the Greenville Treaty, which pushed the Odawa off. Then in the 1830s, there was the Indian Removal Act. So this is just something that they've just perfected to now um, redistribute their damage on other people, you know? So it's the same idea that's happening over and over again. And the way that we can combat this is like, looking at the root of this, what's the root? It was what we did to indigenous peoples. Like let's um, save space for indigenous people. Even if they don't show up, like offering space and acknowledging like this is still our land, you know? Like everyone wants to say it's stolen, but it, it didn't go nowhere, it's still here, you know? So what are your roots? Because I think as we live, in occupied spaces like Chicago is like we have that missing piece inside of us that's connected to our land wherever that is and if we can find that space then we can live here more comfortably you know like uh, we can heal each other by filling in those spaces which is that disconnection from the land. What can the people in this room do to actively practice decolonization in Chicago? I would say the first thing you know is this right here and include us in conversations about us Hello, uh, my name is Winfield Wundedai. I'm uh, Northern Cheyenne and Ojibwe. Uh, one thing we can do to stop this uh, gentrification, uh, white people, just stay where you are, all right? Just, <laughs> just, we gave you a lot of land already, you know, just, to just be happy with it, you know? You know, I think the idea of like staying where you are in your land, right? Maybe the best thing to do if you appreciate a neighborhood, Benji Hart said this on this show, is to not move into it, right? If you think it's so great. Um, what are some of the other ways that you guys were thinking about? Like, give us our land back, you know? Give us money. <laughs> <laughs> Bitch, move! <laughs> if you want to decolonize, like, that literally means like getting up, moving, and repatriating land and life of indigenous people. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're not really working towards the repatriation of land and life and indigenous people, then don't use the word decolonize because that's yeah. what it means. The second thing is like, not just acknowledge the land you're standing on, but actually get to know the land that you're standing on. Um, know how to treat the soil, know what plants are supposed to be here, know how to grow those plants. Um, talk to native people, get to know us. Like we're all over the place. We got to our featured guest this evening. Our featured guest tonight is also our musical performer. Uh, sustainability, y'all. Uh, Frank Juan <laughs> is Lakota from the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. He is a hip-hop artist, producer, and activist. 
He received the Gates Millennium Scholarship and attended Columbia College, where he received a BA in audio arts and acoustics. He performs his music and leads workshops for Native youth around the country, and he's written for various publications, including The Guardian. He's a member of the Dream Warriors Collective. Please welcome Frank Wan. <laughs> I when anyone uh, more attractive than me is on. <laughs> but can't control everything. No matter how hard you try. Um, all right, so I think it's really important to like honor and kind of like lift up our predecessors and the elders who shaped the work that we do now. So I want to ask you, who do you see as your elders in terms of your art and your activism? Um, well, I, I, I come from the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota, so man, I could tell you too many stories of elders, aunties, uncles, my mother, just people who believed in me and my gift when I didn't believe in myself and, and you know, kind of saw something in me when I didn't. Um, when I didn't look at myself in the best light, because as you all heard, you know, we're living in, in a settler colony built on the erasure and genocide of our people. So growing up as a young Native person, you know, you're not taught too, too good of things about yourself. So, so um, you know, and I believe that for a while. So my mother definitely, um, you know, aunties, uncles, elders from back home that, that choose to remain nameless. And uh, John Trudell, he's a Native poet activist, um, just, just a brilliant mind. He and so for those of us who don't know, can you give us some background in your activist work? Well, I always felt weird about the word activist. I never called myself an activist. People started calling me that, and the reason why I was talking about land in my music, doing workshops with some of these Shy Nations youth people when I first, well, these I knew these guys when they were the little shit kids. You used to have to, <laughs> <laughs> but um, so so you know, I did things like that not because I was an activist, but because I'm just Lakota, like where I come from, like in your culture, they teach you to care about everyone. They teach you to care about the people you live with, and you know, care about the land you live on, and the water you drink, and the air we breathe than each other and it's not because I'm an activist it's because I'm Lakota and I'm coming from something that's older than that term even I think my Lakota name given to me um, in ceremony by my elders is Oyate Trecha Obmani which means <clears throat> Oyate means nation or people Trecha means young and Obmani means walks with. So walks with the young nation or walks with the new nation. And that name was given to me years ago before I even got my degree here. And I was taught that that's the name that belongs to my spirit. And so, you know, I, 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 was, I decided to use my gift to help the generations coming after me. And it led me to where I'm at. What do you think it means to have a decolonial art practice? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think when I perform, you might see some examples of that. But... So I'm going to do a song here. The first song I'm going to do is a song where I'm rapping completely in Lakota. And I'm not fluent. Like, my great-grandmother took our language to the grave because of boarding schools. You know, they were abused. All the children that survived carried extreme emotional trauma. And it was illegal for us to practice our ceremonies and cultures in this country until 1978, the Indian Religious Freedom Act. From 1884 to 1978, for almost 100 years, it was illegal for us to even be indigenous. So, you know, th that caused so much trauma in our communities, in cities, on reservations, small towns all over. So I think our generation, you know, Shy Nations youth, me, we're, we're, we're trying to heal those wounds. And so, I decided to use my art and my songwriting, I'm a rapper, to learn my language and to use the resources that now exist. When I was younger, growing up on a re the Rosebud Reservation, the only thing they taught us in our language was the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag. That's the only thing they taught us in Lakota. But now there's language revitalization programs, there's a Lakota language consortium, you know, there's a dope app, there's resources. So I've, I've been using those resources, but I, when I wrote this song I'm going to do with you all, I, I went from a non-Western structure, so I didn't do 16-bar verse, 8-bar hook. You know, I, I was learning some of our old ceremony songs, thousands of years old, songs that survived genocide, you know, and, and translating those and looking at how my ancestors wrote songs. And then I, I realized it was like very short, powerful, poetic phrases repeated, not too different from trap. So I decided to, you know, um, write a hip-hop song like that. Hip hop, right? Which is like this, like black cultural idiom, uh, like immigrant black cultural idiom too, right? Like if we think about like that, and you're integrating your indigenous language and using samples of indigenous music, um, like where do you see like the deeper possibilities for solidarity between black and brown movements and artists through this kind of uh, art practice? It's a great question. I have a story from the Iman retreat that I think showed me the answer to this. So I, I, I um, just I did an acapella of the song in my language um, at the retreat. And I was sitting talking with these two um, friends of mine 
uh, at Iman. One of them, he's a black rapper. He goes by One Below. I don't know if anyone ever heard him. He's kind of OG. He's from uh, Detroit area. But he travels all around, and, 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 and he has a lot of roots out in um, Egypt now. And then a uh, sister, her name is Benta, and she works for Iman, but she's Senegalese. And I forget, like, Benta's family speaks a language, a language spoken in Senegal, and One Below's family spoke another African language that I forgot. But we're, they're asking me about that song, and he said, you know what, man? Like, when you were flowing and, and doing that song in your language, it didn't sound foreign to my ears. And Benta, she was like, yeah, like, that's what I, I can't, I couldn't articulate it, but that's what it felt like. Like, even though it was Lakota, like, it didn't sound foreign to their ears, and they're coming from families that speak languages that are spoken in Africa. And so I think, you know, just things like that, like, seeing the similarities in our, in our stories and our struggles in our communities through our art and being like, hey, we are similar. Hey, we did get fucked up by the same people. Let, let, let's see where we can figure this out. Let's give it up for Frank Juan. <laughs> Today's show was entitled Decolonization and Indigenous Practice. The word decolonization has become commonplace. It sounds fucking great in think pieces and tweets and on t-shirts and laptop stickers. But non-native U.S. racialized people are especially writing the D word hard these days, letting everyone know that everything from beauty standards, bookshelves, diets, and syllabuses need to be liberated from their white Western European and settler trappings. And while that may be true, it's hard not to see this flurry around decolonization as a trend. But the reality is decolonization is not a trend, just like decolonization is not for your individual reactive enlightenment, because decolonization is not a fucking metaphor. Instead, it implies very literally the restoration of land and sovereignty to indigenous people, which is a radical objective that demands a radical orientation. As native thinker Patrick Wolf says, colonization is a structure, not an event. And that means that colonization didn't happen. It is fucking happening right now. It is ongoing. And as we say goodbye tonight and we go out into the city, I want us all to remember stolen land and native genocide and territorial expropriation is, a co is the condition of possibility of us being here. And I want us to think about what role we play in decolonizing this bitch. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Okay, get the beat up, please. Check one, two, check one, two. So it'll be like this, like, oh, yeah, all right? One, two, three, four. One now we teach yaga, one now we teach yaga, one now we teach yaga. Oh yeah, te. One now we teach yaga, one now we teach yaga, one now we teach yaga. Ni na gibo black e hanta tanya, ana hotanyo, ana hotanyo. Preta ki, ki ni yage, o ichi yapo, o ichi yapo. Ni na gibo black e hanta tanya, ana hotanyo, ana hotanyo. Preta ki. Yeah. Now just like we practiced, I need you guys to say it, but let's say it on beat this time and a little bit louder. We're acting like we weren't sure of ourselves, alright? So let's try it out. One, two, three, four. One now we chichaga, one now we chichaga, one now we chichaga. One now we chichaga, alright? As loud as you can now, let's go one more time. One now we chichaga, one now we chichaga, one now we chichaga. One now we chichaga, one now we chichaga. Now one more round, let's go. One now we chichaga, one now we chichaga, one now we chichaga. One now we chichaga, one now we chichaga, one now one more time. Thank you very much.
fights and all the pain, all the change. I hate my dad, don't want his name. Told my mom that I'm a wand, didn't understand all the things going on between her and my fam. But I was stubborn, I know that I make it hard. You always said, son, I know you're gonna make it far. Believe that, I need that in dark times. I think of what you did for me and my heart shines. You took my hand up this mountain, made it your climb. So when I shine, mom, you shine. Yeah, a single mother with the odd stack. Thank you guys very much. I am Frank Juan. You can follow me online. Thank you to Ricardo. Thank you to the show for having me on. Thank you guys very much.